Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope you're doing well. As we close out this week, I read The Burglar by David Goodis, which is a fantastic little crime novel published in 1953. Uh, it's quite dark, like all of the other works from David Goodis that I've read. Uh, it, it's quite dark. He's steeped in that early, you know, uh, U U.S. crime novel tradition that Dashiell Hammett, James M. Cain. But you can also tell there, there's, this is a guy who has, you know, walked a few miles with like Schopenhauer running around in his mind. And there's, there's a sense of pessimism that sort of like hovers over uh, the proceedings of the book. And it, it's a really interesting book. The Burglar, obviously, it's primarily from the perspective of Nat Harbin, who is a like safe cracker and, uh, and a, you know, a burglar. And what's also really interesting is even though it's in, written in the early 1950s, it has this whole inversion of that like stereotypical like United States, like, you know, uh, immediate family, like, you know, close-knit family circle, because the family is a family of burglars who aren't actually related to each other, but they've formed as a group a sort of family, and it's very insular, it's very tight-knit, and, uh, and so Goodis is almost like probing at that idea of what is developing in the 1950s cultural consciousness of this, you know, stereotypical family uh, with this crime novel, and so it's really interesting. And of course, what happens when you introduce other relationships or, or outsiders uh, who, <coughs> who kind of pry at that family. Uh, what, what is the danger that breaks out? Um, and so it, uh, it like m not all but many of Goodis's works, it's set primarily in Philadelphia, although we do have a uh, really interesting interlude out to uh, sort of the rural areas of Pennsylvania outside of Philly. And then the final third-ish of the novel takes place in Atlantic City. Uh, there's this harrowing nighttime stormy drive to Atlantic City, and then that's where sort of the, the various criminal plots reach this crescendo. Um, and it, it's, I, I highly recommend it. If you've never read David Goodis, he's a writer, I think, everybody should read at least one book by David Goodis. I don't know if this is the book. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two others uh, at the end of the video, but it's, it's certainly a strong entry. It's, it's well worth reading if you enjoy crime novels. Um, and it, it, it's again one that's sort of from the perspective of the criminals. I want to read a quick passage so people can kind of get an idea. Let's see. At the safe, Harbin took another look at his wristwatch. He gazed at the safe, ignoring the combination dial and concentrating on the edges of the brass square. He glanced again at his wristwatch and gave himself five minutes at the outside. He began chewing on the unlit cigarette as he removed the important tool from the flannel case. The important tool was a tiny circular saw revolved by a pumping process on the order of a hypodermic syringe. The teeth of the saw bit through oak that paneled the brass square. Harbin had his face close to the oak, but every now and then he took it away to see if there was any green light on the wall near him. The green light would be from Gladden's flashlight in case she needed to use it. The chances were he would see the signal anyway if it came, but he had to be sure, because here her flashlight threw a wire of green glow, and if it wasn't aimed just right he would miss it. But if the green light did come, it would mean that Gladden had received an alarm from either Domer or Blaylock, or both of them. It would mean that Domer had, would come running to the window to climb in and intercept anyone coming down from upstairs, to use the special brand of Domer technique to silently yet firmly quiet the intercepting party, or possibly it could mean interception coming from outside, and Domer and Blaylock would be forced into a decoy setup. It could mean a great many things, and Harbin had all the potentials carefully listed in his brain. The saw finished one side of the square. The rhythm of the saw made a sound, something like that of a man groaning deep in his throat. It was a night sound, and it could be an insect out there in the springtime air, or it could be the distant sound of an automobile. And so Goodis presents us, you know, there's, there's tension as we're in this robbery, but there's also these weird things of like, here's how normal this, <laughs> this burglary could actually be. And, and so, as a, I don't want to give too much away of the plot because it's a crime novel, and, like many crime novels, the plot's important. Um, you have, we start out with a burglary that there's a, you know, there is, you know, an intrusion into it uh, that creates a, a new sense of danger and it feels dangerous. It feels harrowing in those first 20 pages as we have the robber, uh, the burglary. And then as they do that, they realize, okay, with the danger, we maybe need to start separating. So that family starts to pull apart and then other people, you know, they start meeting other people and that introduces this new level of danger. Um, and, bringing us to Atlantic City and, and final scenes out on the beach and the boardwalk there in Atlantic City. So uh, it, it really does develop. It feels like the, 
there is a sense of sort of like Greek tragedy or fatalism that pervades the, the work as a whole. And I want to read another paragraph from later in the book that sort of intimates what that's like. On the boardwalk, he approached the hotel. He saw the sun hitting the silvery rail that separated the raised boards from the beach. There were a lot of people on the beach and most of them wore bathing suits. The beach was white yellow under the sun. He looked at the ocean and it was flat and passive with the heavy heat coming down on it, giving it the look of hot green metal. The waves were small and seemed to lack enthusiasm as they came up against the beach. In the water, the bathers moved slowly, without much enjoyment, getting wet but not cool. He knew the water was warm and sticky and probably very dirty from the storm of Saturday night. Even so, he told himself he would like to be in there in the ocean with the bathers, and maybe he and Gladden would have themselves a swim before leaving Atlantic City. The thought was an extreme sort of optimism, but he repeated the thought and kept repeating it as he moved toward the entrance of the hotel. And so there we see this idea of like, for Goodis and, and for his characters, there is this sense of dream of like, oh, it could be a vacation at the beach, but there, there's never this, we're, we're never actually lulled into this true comfort of, yeah, these are people vacationing, you know, in Atlantic City at the beach. It's, we're, ta we're talking about dingy motels and hotels. We're talking about water that is dirty that nobody really wants to be swimming in, but they're there, you know, and they're doing it. And it, it's just this, this fascinating take of just how, um, how cynical the, the entire sort of existence can feel. Um, and so it, it's quite good. Uh, and I, as I mentioned, Goodis is sort of a crime writer probably many of us are aware of, even though so few have actually read his works. The main reason for that is he wrote a number of books, uh, and again, I, I do recommend this one, he wrote a number of books that became films. So uh, Dark Passage was filmed with Humphrey Bogart and Lauren McCall in the 1940s. Um, down there was later uh, the book itself, I think for the most part, has only been published by, uh, since the 1960s, has only been published by the title uh, it was filmed as, which was Shoot the Piano Player by Francois Truffaut. And his, his books have this influence beyond strictly just being adapted, where uh, filmmakers like Jean-Pierre Melville and his great film Le Cirque Rouge, which involves like a jewel burglary and sort of this sense of danger around, around the group of burglars, I feel highly influenced by uh, David Goodis' writing. Um, so he highly, highly recommend David Goodis. This is a good book. Um, some other crime novels that reminded me of, so two that jumped out. One was The Postman Always Rings Twice by James M. Cain, in part because of, I really feel like the ending of uh, The Burglar was absolutely written sort of as, almost as a response to The Postman Always Rings Twice. Um, another one would be Thieves Like Us by Edward Anderson, which sort of is from the perspective of a group of like 1930s bank robbers. Um, a uh, Shoot the Piano Player was originally published as Downfall, or sorry, Down There. Nightfall is another really strange goodest book. Um, I think stranger than Dark Passage, stranger than uh, The Burglar, um, and you have, you have a guy who is basically having an identity crisis. He can't remember whether or not he committed a crime or who he actually is. And it's just fascinating how it unravels. This is probably like the strongest of his books I've read. Um, it, I think Goodis is very dark in the same way that Jim Thompson, this is uh, nothing more than murder, in the same way that Jim Thompson can be. Except I think he has a, uh, he, he does feel that there's beauty in the world. It's just that humans have a tendency to sort of like muddy the beauty of the world. And Thompson, I'm not sure ever actually feels that way. And then another sort of forgotten, you know, noir classic would be Black, Black Wings Has My Angel by Elliot Chase. And just a harrowing, like strange um, uh, book that, that revolves around a, a couple. Um, and this sort of from that same era. The Parker books by Richard Stark. I don't know, they felt like an, a semblance of that. Maybe uh, The Seventh, <laughs> where there's sort of, you know, the gang fights <laughs> after they've, they've, uh, they've completed their score. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, Goodis feels like there's a sense of pessimism, there's a sense of fatalism in his books, and he feels like it's, it's what happens if you have a Greek tragedy, and, and your crime novel is a Greek tragedy. And so um, Oedipus Tyrannus by Sophocles, kind of reminds me of that, of, the, of this sense of the characters make decisions because of who they are 
And that is what drives the plot. Not that the plot forces the characters to make decisions, but we're, we have characters who are grounded and in their grounding they make these decisions and that's what drives the plot. So The Burglar by David Goodis, give it a shot if you, if you ever find these. I spent years, uh, I, I was aware of David Goodis in like 2005 and I don't think I ever found one of his books until, gosh, at least like 2012. So if you find a David Goodis, give it a shot. Thanks.